Welcome, everybody. It's my uh, big pleasure to welcome uh, Alan Blythe today. He is our, um, what's your official title, affiliate scientist, yes, yes. right? Um, Alan uh, works at the National Center of Atmospheric Science at the University of Leeds, where he is the director of atmospheric physics and professor of atmospheric science research. Um, he has a large career here in the US, so after his uh, PhD uh, at the University of uh, Manchester, actually University of Man Manchester Institute of Science and Technology, which back then was not part, but now is part of the University of Manchester. However, that works. Um, after that, he um, got a NERC fellowship and uh, worked at the University of Wyoming for a couple of years before he moved to uh, New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology, uh, where he worked with uh, Dave Raymond and uh, became a professor and eventually chair of the physics department. And in 2001, he moved back to the UK and has been at the University of uh, Leeds ever since. Yeah. So I looked up, he actually has quite an established publication record, um, 80 or 90 or something, whatever I could find. Oh, uh, right. Somewhere there, right? Yeah. It's hard but, work writing papers. I don't seem to write so many. <laughs> there was a lot of hard work that I saw. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's welcome uh, Alan for his talk, The Role of Multiple Thermals in Development of Precipitation. Alan, please. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Um, Thank you for inviting me here. It's really a pleasure to be here. It's a very wonderful summer. It's a lot of fun. Thank you. It's also a, a real honor to me to uh, be a, an affiliate scientist here. I, it's a really enjoyable thing uh, uh, to to have here. Uh, um, uh, I'll, I'll just read out the titles when <laughs> when we get to them. I'm going to uh, talk about uh, multiple thermals and uh, development of hi Roy, uh, um, development of ice and precipitation and and so on. Um, I've thought about this for for a long time. It's not a new idea at all. Um, there's a really nice paper by Koenig in 1963. And what it says up there is pulsating thermals in Project White Top. So this is a really old project, and I, I like this. Commonly, these clouds were found to have lifespans of the order of one hour and a pulsating growth habit, multiple thermals in other words, similar to that described by Skor and Ludlum's 1953 bubble theory of convection. Each bubble or turret comprising the uppermost portion of the cloud was visible generally for five to ten minutes initially as an active, hard appearing ascending cloud mass, later as a dissipating fibrous cloud mass whose place as the cloud summit was soon to be lost to a younger active bubble. So nothing is, is ever new, is it? Uh, but this, uh, this is multiple thermals and I just want to explore that a little bit more. Uh, I, mean, I can tell you the, the story right now and you can fall asleep or go away if you like, but uh, I think it's so important to include the dynamics and the microphysics together. Um, uh, the, the, the whole package is, is so important in considering these, these clouds. Uh, here, here's an example from Mason and Jonas where the, uh, this was the initial thermal. Uh, they were looking at the development of warm rain process, initial thermal, the thermal uh, evaporating, and then the second thermal going through. I uh, don't want to talk about the results or just the idea. And, and interestingly, if Paul were here, I'd, I'd like to uh, talk to him about this. This is in tropical cumulus clouds. I, I know Andy said he was listening from a hotel measuring He's measuring Graupel out there, um, so maybe he can, I don't think he can speak to us, uh, 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 maybe he can tell me later, Andy. Um, this, the Learjet was flying 500 meter below the C-130 to, to compare the wind measuring systems. This is a C-130 and this is a Learjet, so the Learjet's down here, so clearly a new thermal going through these tropical clouds, and that's, that's significant. I'll come back to that. Um, and here's some work by uh, uh, Sonia, uh, Daniel Moser, and 
Lash or Trapp, some modeling studies looking at multiple thermals, um, looking at the entrainment process in these multiple thermals. <sighs> Uh, so I'll, I'm telling you this just so you realize there's an awful lot of work going on in these multiple thermal I ideas. Uh, when I gave the abstract and the title just a few days ago late, I'm sorry, but um, I didn't really know what I was going to talk about because I ta have talked about this uh, COPE experiment um, before and I hadn't made as much progress as I, as I have now. So I want to use the results from this experiment to discuss multiple thermals um, in, in COPE. So this is from the BAMS paper. Um, it's an experiment that was held in the southwest of the United Kingdom. And this is the motivation of, of COPE. Uh, Winnie the Pooh managed to get his, save his honey and himself uh, because there was some warning of, a, of the flooding there. And that really is uh, the motivation for all these this kind of work. Um, the domain of, of the experiment is the southwest of England. This is where the United Kingdom Met Office is. We had a radar positioned here, and these blue rings are the, the, net, is the network radars, Met Office network radars. And there was a famous flash flood in Boscastle. This is from, from a paper by Warren et al. Um, and this, this is a, a rain rate that's plotted here. And starting at about 12 UTC, uh, you see this uh, line. It's rather short, and it's quite narrow, uh, and very high rain rates developing just over a catchment area. So it is really a perfect storm. And it sits there, that same white spot, or these white spots, uh, sit over the catchment for uh, four hours or so. And there was incredible flooding. And this kind of thing is caused by uh, the sea breeze fronts, uh, convergence lines. Uh, Jim, you asked me about that once, and I, I just said convergence line. You said, I know that. <laughs> these are sea breeze fronts. Um, that, that uh, so, oh dear, this isn't very good. <laughs> um, so the ultimate goal is to increase the warning time for flash flooding, um, prove the prediction of the quantity of convective precipitation. I'm particularly interested in understanding the interactions between the microphysics and dynamics. And of course, uh, as has happened, prov providing observations for model evaluation um, that's a, a really important thing to do these days, in particular as, mo as model resolution increases. So um, we've had some success in that as well. Here are some of the instruments and platforms which I showed last time. The aerosol container, measurements of CCN, some of ice nuclei, um, and other properties of the aerosol, including a little bit of ultra-giant aerosols, but not much. This was a new radar at the time, which was a really horrendous place to operate from, actually, because the local hooligans from nearby came and take, took pot shots with their air rifles at any big target, and this is such a target. We were fortunate not to have any damage. <laughs> and uh, the UK research aircraft, the FAM BAE-146, and the uh, Wyoming King Air. There was another aircraft called the Mocha aircraft that operated in the boundary layer occasionally. It didn't work, operate very often. So this is a situation, the um, satellite image of the convergence, the clouds along the convergence line lines on the 3rd of August 2013. And this is the the reflectivity, radar reflectivity from our radar. You can immediately see, if you think about the Boscastle situation, that this is quite different. The intense um, reflectivity here and here and here. The line is more uh, jagged. Um, it's thicker in places. And I'll show you later that it's not so uniform. So there wasn't a flash flood here in this situation. But nevertheless, I'm interested in the production of the heavy precipitation. It was a nice example because there was relatively good sampling. <clears throat> a 
comparing the rainfall, the precipitation rate in clouds that were isolated versus clouds that formed along the line, see that the precipitation rate is much greater in these um, what we've called closely packed clouds along the line. So here's a series of um, radar reflectivities at various times, 1323 all the way through to 1504. Um, and this corresponds to uh, the top 1% rain rate. You can see that the rain rate is, is uh, varying quite considerably uh, uh, across this, this period. Um, but also you can see how variable the, the reflectivity is. And um, it's not obviously the highest reflectivity is when you get the greatest rain rate, but it's not in the same, the, the maximum reflectivity is not in the same place at any, at any time. And there's uh, an incredible variability uh, with time and space. That's, that's completely different to the Boss Castle situation. Nevertheless, as I, I've said, why do we get such uh, intense uh, reflectivity values and intense uh, rain rates? <clears throat> this is the sounding for the day. Uh, so clouds went up to around uh, six kilometers or so just over, over here. Apparently in Boscastle, uh, they were deeper than that, nine kilometers. Um, it's interesting, actually, speaking to some of the locals in the, uh, that experienced the Boss Castle storms versus uh, storms that occurred in this kind of day. Um, they, they all said that they'd never seen anything quite like it. Uh, the sky was completely black. Uh, it looked like the heavens were just going to, going to open. I mean, it's not very common in the UK to get a big thunderstorm like you did here on, on Sunday, but, um, but it, it, it appeared sort of like that on, on that day. Um, so that clearly it's not just the, uh, the narrowness of the line, but also the intensity, the, the, the depth of the storm and the intensity of the, of the rainfall. Uh, so this is uh, from the wharf model. Um, it's uh, clouds. So here are clouds and the airflow. And so uh, I wanted to show this for Jan's benefit mainly, but um, I can't see this coastline. So the coastline's down here, uh, and here are the here are the clouds here. So um, we there are we think ultra giant aerosols. So it's not very far from the from the coastline. It's a fairly strong strong wind. You can see the turning that uh, generates the, the sea breeze fronts here. We didn't have any measurements, unfortunately, at the low levels, so these are uh, the next best thing. <clears throat> and this is um, the convergence line, again, from Wharf at various times, um, two times, sorry, 12.01, and then uh, about 15 minutes later at two altitudes, at 500 meters and then 1,500 meters. So you can see that it was broken up into the clouds here. Uh, and why I'm showing these two is that this is, this is broken up in the model too. So it's not a uniform line that lasts uh, um, for a long period of time. This is only 15 minutes and it's already, there's already a, a break in the thing here. Uh, so these clouds are, are clearly controlled by the, the dynamics of the situation. And there's a lot of orography around here. Presumably that has a lot to do with it as, as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this is a cross section across the perpendicular to the convergence line. This is air motion away from the radar and towards the radar. So it kind of looks like a, a gust front so the ultra giant aerosols would be going up here. Uh, this is from the um, uh, south. What, which way around is it? Now? The southwest. Um, but this is actually toward. This is across towards the southeast. But the wind is has got a component uh, from the southeast. This is a wharf model, and it shows roughly the same sort of picture. Uh, this is cooler. This is slightly warmer. And, and then these clouds forming at the head of the gust front. Yeah, 
2.5 kilometers. Are the scales the same? No, I'm sorry, they're not. <laughs> and it's cut off here uh, um, for display. I'm sorry about that. This is, um, that's, it's on here somewhere. I think it might be about here. Um, so, uh, what I think is happening here is that there's this plume like flow uh, in. Uh, over the the gas front, and these thermals are are spawned, uh, so maybe slightly more vigorously lifting the air. So uh, there might be a little more cape um, available to those particular clouds, a combination of plume-like and and thermal-like. So there was a particular cloud that the uh, Wyoming King Air uh, made several passes through. Uh, and these, this, uh, this cloud is shown here, starting from this time um, with a very low reflectivity. You see the, the progression here. Um, and then it joined the, the convergence line at this point. There were actually two passes uh, through this volume scan. Um, the aircraft passed twice in the same volume scan makes tricky plotting. <laughs> and this is a time height that are of the reflectivity, um, maximum reflectivity and a maximum differential reflectivity uh, for that particular cloud as it moved, moved along. Um, and see a maximum reflectivity of about 55 dBz. And in this region, the higher ZDR um, in a region with relatively low uh, values of reflectivity. Um, so this looks very much like uh, Charlie's uh, plots in the 2002 paper, I think. Uh, so comparing that with a model uh, called MAC-3, a sophisticated cloud physics model, um, does calculations of detailed microphysics. The dynamics are um, relatively straightforward. It's an axisymmetric model, not a full uh, two-dimensional or three-dimensional model, but still has a reasonable dynamics. It's take care of uh, a lot of the, the diffusion terms, etc. So the time height diagram, this color uh, is is blue. I'm sorry, this is complicated, but my I uh, was moaning to people earlier. My postdoc that's working on this has left a long time ago. <laughs> I've left trying to take out lines and things that, which didn't work. Um, so this blue is the cloud droplets. There's a a black which looks awfully green in here. That's <laughs> uh, a reflectivity. This this one here. So the first echo from the model is at about the same height as the uh, radar observations, um, and then the slopes of the uh, radar reflectivity were about the same as uh, the upper levels of the um, observations. The green here is graupel, and this uh, sort of reddish brown color on this uh, plot is, is are the raindrops. Um, so all of these details uh, that you see here are, are very similar to the observations, uh, and, and there are some details down here that, that suggest that, if you take my word for it. Looking a bit more detail at, at this, and um, Sonia has leading a paper, um, and I, I, I think it's been accepted in um, Jam C. Um, uh, doing some modeling on the same same case. Uh, so you, you see, see the, these are the the raindrops, and the green is the, are the this, this is the graupel, and this here is the, are the ice particles. Um, and so the raindrops begin to fall in the weaker. Uh, updraft here, as do the the graupel particles. Uh, 
and eventually the the rain comes down down to the ground uh, and, and the grapple particles move further down too and this is a uh, an important point here, these are the ice crystals uh, in the temperature region of the Hallett Mossop zone. Um, so these gravel particles can move uh, downwards um, in slightly weaker updraft, in a slightly weaker updraft. Uh, but if you were flying through here, flying through the top of the cloud, you would never see this, of course. You'd be flying through and not see very much ice. And this is uh, shown here. This is the, these are the cloud drops. And these are the ice particles. This is, this is a time height. This is altitude versus time. So if you're flying around here, you don't, you'll never actually see this. Now these are the particles generated uh, in the in the Hallett Mossop zone. I wanted to show you. Uh, the uh, supercool raindrops. This is uh, reflectivity and um, ZDR, the differential reflectivity. This is the zero degree level. Uh, so relatively low reflectivity, relatively high values of, of ZDR. Um, so this is, I think, is equivalent to, uh, I, I don't know, Charlie, maybe a, uh, five millimeter drops or something like that. Um, plotting the um, differential reflectivity in the, in the model uh, at two different times here. This is, is ZDR, this is the reflectivity. Um, here, their, their maximum values of the ZDR in the model are displaced from the maximum rainfall, um, which you, you see in the observations as well. So these values are the maximum um, ZDR values, and they're slightly offset from the maximum updraft. Uh, here, are the, here is the updraft value, so it's in, in this region here. Unfortunately, this one has gone off off screen, but as the, the drops grow larger and the, the updraft weakens, as you might expect, the maximum ZDR is in, in the rainfall shaft. So we've got two different situations here earlier on uh, and later when the, the super cool, there are super cool drops and then when they're falling in the, the rain shaft. Oops. So now, um, Let's look at the Wyoming uh, um, King Air passes. I think we can just see it here. There's also um, Robert, Bobby Jackson and Jeff French and others have just submitted a paper and it's uh, currently on ACPD. Um, they have more measurements uh, from different days uh, in COPE. Uh, and uh, they have um, the concentrations of ice particles, which I'm afraid I don't at the moment. <laughs> so I'm uh, sorry that I don't have the actual ice concentrations. It would be extremely valuable for me to have, but I don't have them. <laughs> My program didn't work uh, this weekend. <laughs> so in the top here, we have the concentration of cloud droplets, and then an indication of, of the ice, the um, shadow R signal. And then the amount of liquid water, so there's uh, about 350 um, per cubic centimeter of drops um, over two, two and a half uh, grams per cubic meter, and an updraft here of going up to 15 meters per second. Um, this is the temperature, so um, that you can see that that region is, uh, that cloud is fairly buoyant and here is a picture of the cloud from the forward facing camera and uh, this is a Doppler a radar picture showing that there is indeed a, an updraft here and then the, um, the blue is a downdraft and then um, the only ice particle you could see or particle you could see it's very spherical whether it's a drop or a grub particle is on unclear. So that's at uh, 
uh, temperature. All the important information, I'm afraid, this time is at the top. So it's at 4.5 kilometers, minus 10. And the cloud top is 4.8 kilometers, and perhaps there's 17 per liter of ice. The next pass is at, so sorry, that pass was at 13.10, 30. Three minutes later, um, at 4.7 kilometers, about minus 11, there's approximately the same amount of ice. Um, the updraft is decaying, the maximum is about 5 meters per second. The liquid water content is a little lower, the cloud con co concentration of cloud drops is a, a little lower. There's uh, maybe a, a few more images here. Um, it's interesting that the cloud looks different, it's not quite so vigorous there. Then uh, six minutes later, it is the same cloud region. Um, there is basically no updraft. Uh, it is the uh, concentration about the same, about the same amount of ice, uh, same amount of liquid, same temperature, and so on. And then um, three minutes after that, three minutes, yep, about three minutes after that, there's a new updraft, um, which was this one here. It's a bit harder to see, and an awful lot more ice. Um, and unfortunately, as I said, I don't have the actual values, um, but it's clear from the images and the time between them and everything that there is more, more ice and the shadow R, etc. Uh, there's less liquid um, than before, however, um, but there is a new, new updraft here. So, possible explanation for this. Uh, um, this is a sing Mach 3 with a single thermal, and then when another thermal was um, initiated, 17 minutes later, I think, or maybe slightly less than that, um, there's more ice generated, and some of it um, makes its way towards the top of the cloud. This depends, of course, on the situation in the model and what you're artificially uh, putting in there. If you, had, if you were able to do it properly, uh, you might get more carried up there, but I think you get the, the picture. And uh, although I don't have the, um, the concentrations here, unfortunately, I've followed this uh, quite carefully with the radar, and uh, it clearly is a, a new thermal. So it's not a new idea, that, of course, but uh, so all I'm saying here is that you have to consider the dynamics. You can't uh, give up on the Hallett mosset process just because you haven't seen uh, some of the, the crystals being generated. Um, so the, this is the schematic of what's going on. Um, perhaps you get some generated in here. Some grapples fallen from a higher level in a weaker updraft into the Hallett Mossop zone, and then along comes another thermal and um, takes uh, those crystals up to the higher level. So I wanted to uh, um, um, mention the Lawson papers just for um, uh, because I, I was interested in that. And can you actually? He, he never, I don't think he ever mentioned the Hallett Mosset process at all, and I was really curious about this. Um, he, he, th he sees these uh, spicules, um, which, is, which is really also an old idea. Uh, Chisnell and Latham and, and many others have looked at Andy. Andy's uh, seen some of this too, but there have been new laboratory experiments showing these sort of things happening, the drop shattering and producing these spicules. Um, there's also some lab studies saying that when they're salt in them, they don't produce so many. Um, so all I'm saying here really is that you can't ignore the hallett mosset process. There's not enough evidence to ignore it completely. He doesn't talk about it at all and, and suggests a new process. And I don't think that's right. Uh, I don't think you can ignore it. You saw the, the new updraft um, at a <clears throat> from measured by the Learjet. Um, so, unless you can completely rule out secondary thermals. But also, another interesting fact, I think, well, this is a, the updraft speed, um, measured by the Wyoming King, from one of the previous 
passes. And there's quite a variation in this. So obviously, if this is 15 meters per second or so, um, uh, and maybe this is five or, or so meters per second. So there's a region here where the gravel particles could, could quite easily fall down. Um, the ascent rate of the cloud is, this arrow is less than that arrow. Uh, the ascent rate is less than the actual updraft, so the, the particles could be taken up to the top of the cloud, and you could easily be, be a bit misled by this if you're following the top of the cloud. Um, so that, that, that really is uh, the, all I'm trying to say here is uh, you can't really ignore this process that's happening in this one particular zone. So I wanted to explore uh, a bit more the um, uh, how the, the, the clouds were um, moving along the line and developing as they go to see if there was any evidence of these secondary thermals. It's awfully difficult to do that with the, the radar. Um, this is this is covered about 30, 30 kilometers, um, and there's an awful lot of different clouds in here, and about uh, a kilometer wide at, at the most. I try to track um, a region of clouds, which is also, also awfully difficult, but using the um, pattern recognition and the average wind speed, um, so put a box around the particular region of cloud, and there's some questionable parts perhaps, but uh, when, you, when you do this kind of thing, you get get this. Unfortunately, as the clouds came closer to the radar, we got off the tops and we were looking. The aircraft were further away, and we were looking here, so we couldn't cover everything. But you see here um, the change in the reflectivity. This is the maximum reflectivity uh, height versus time. The scans were made at these um, times. This is the differential reflectivity, and perhaps you might be convinced that this there are two major a major updraft here and then a decay period and then another major updraft here when you look at this with look at the, the fine scale of the maximum values anything below 50 is in blue um, this is perhaps going up to 58 DBZ and this is above above 60, so it's not a not a huge increase. <laughs> it is a log scale, but it's not a huge increase in the reflectivity. But there is a an increase in this second um, second thermal area. So if we uh, then look at the, what the WARF model is saying, with a view of trying to tell the difference between them, and if the model is missing anything out. Um, uh, uh, that's what I've got plotted here. This is the reflectivity, the raindrops, um, the amount of ice, ice particles, and uh, the graupel particles. Um, there isn't really a, a much of a difference here. There's, a, there's no increase in the reflectivity with time in the WARF model. There is a peak in the raindrops slightly, slightly later. There are peaks in the Graupel, but the peaks don't increase with time. These peaks are associated with the generation of ice crystals in the halep mossop zone. I also wanted to look in some more detail at individual clouds versus clouds that produced two thermals. This is in the WARF model. This is a, a single thermal. This is a double thermal. A concentration of ice and a concentration of graupel. And you see that the concentration of ice and graupel in the second thermal is a lot greater than in the first, not surprisingly. We even managed to um, get Keith Browning interested in this problem. I thought he was going to do something else completely, but he, he got really interested in these interacting thermals. So uh, who am I to uh, <laughs> um, not take some uh, good advice from Keith Browning? Uh, um, so these are 
his plots. Uh, I added some things to them. He looked in particular at the cell C interacting with cell B. And there's another cell at the north here. This is Worf, all Worf model. Um, this is at, at one time. Uh, and I don't have the times on there, sorry. I must be somewhere around. <laughs> They're falling off. Um, a slightly later time, let's just say. And you can see this is cell C and cell B. So cell C is going through cell B. And you can see the plan view here. And cell C emerges as a much more vigorous uh, uh, cell than, um, than any of the others. And uh, just for old time's sake, here's one of Keith Browning's famous diagrams where he's tried to put all this sort of thing together. Uh, I'm not going to explain that, but this is, this is cell C going through cell B, and uh, there's remnants from cell, cell A even in here. So, you know, he did all this uh, together. Um, this again is, is Worf. Um, the graupel is on on the left. The, concentr the average mixing ratio of graupel. This is the precipitation rate. And the top one is for um, an isolated cloud, a single cloud, and the bottom one is for the line of clouds. And what I wanted to point out here, the same message: uh, the precipitation rate is much greater in the line of clouds than in the isolated clouds. Uh, and another program I didn't get working, we did some of this in New Mexico, you know, with a very artificial dynamics model, but, but it did have some sophisticated microphysics in here um, where we released some particles, gave it an updraft. You can see the largest graph will falls down, so this is what I'm talking about. That if it falls down, then it can generate some, some crystals in the halit mossop zone. Uh, and of course, this, this is an, a very artificial model. You can give it whatever updraft and downdraft you want, um, and spacing between the, the thermals and so on. When you do it in a real model, the Mach 3 dynamics model, then that's the one I showed before, you get this result. And these could go higher up if, if it had been a slightly stronger updraft. Looking at the actual concentration of ice produced in that kind of situation, uh, the double, this this dash line here, this one here, is for the double thermal in red. That's the one to look at compared with the dotted line, which is this one, is the single thermal. I think you've got the message now, haven't you? <laughs> and, uh, oh dear, another schematic diagram of what's going on here. Um, uh, I don't know. It's not very good. So, in summary, <laughs> then, um, well, well, there was this convergence line, the North Coast Sea Breeze Front colliding with the prevailing southwest wind. I think this is interesting, this sloping plume of moist air two kilometers deep. I mean, people are trying to parameterize these kind of things. Um, then that spawned the, the thermals. It could be a bit more vigorous. Um, multiple closely packed clouds along the line, um, perhaps two stages of growth and decay. The peak precipitation rate reached after two thermals, but it was still large after a single thermal. Um, it was greater in the line and in the isolated clouds. There was more graupel. However, it is quite, it's difficult to separate out the effect of the convergence line from multiple thermals. Uh, as I've said, there was heavy rain, but the line is not constant enough. Um, the peak rain changes location along the line with, with time. Uh, so there wasn't a flash flood. Now, I, I wanted to end with um, just a, a few things about uh, what we're trying to do col um, collaboratively. I'll spend a l Oh, sorry, I didn't finish. Oh, sorry. So what is possibly relevant for models is uh, the warm rain and inclusion of the ultragiant nuclei. Perhaps some models I've worked with, I know they don't include those. The multiple thermals, you've got to get the scale right and the variations in the updraft. Is it important? It's not clear whether it's, uh, as Jan said, whether you just get the uh, sort of, um, you know, 100 kilometer scale and get an average precipitation rate, is that enough? Um, 
But perhaps the small scale variation is important, especially in, in depth limited clouds, such as in the southwest. And then I, I believe this Hallett Mossop process, I've gone back and forward quite a bit on this, but I really think this Hallett Mossop process is important, or, what, or whatever you call it, this is the production of splinters. So we really need to understand these, those rates. That's, that's critical, Al, don't you think? <laughs> You've got a great idea about it. Uh, and also, the density of Graupel is an important thing to have in, in a model. Right, so sorry, as I was saying, uh, uh, I've spent a bit of time on a far too much time trying to chase money and <laughs> um, Jan and I have had some discussions for, about a strategic program that's off the top uh, it's called Reducing the Uncertainty in Climate Sensitivity Due to Clouds I submitted this to NERC it, whether it goes through or not I don't know but there's a, a lot of opportunity for collaboration here um, it's a thing we, sh we really sh should be doing uh, I think um, and it has the possibility of, of having uh, the most important part is at the bottom a possible field project in New Mexico or somewhere somewhere where we have laboratory clouds to address some of these important issues and the key thing is to have people talking to each other cloud physics people talking all the way through modelers and laboratory scientists up to, up to climate modelers. This is being written and going to be submitted to the science board at NERC and whether it gets through or not we, we don't know then there is a project that uh, Sandrine Bonney and Bjorn Stevens are running Eureka 4A elucidating the role of cloud circulation coupling in climate which is in 2020, January and February 2020 um, uh, uh, there's a nice website on Eureka 4A if you want to look it up uh, looking at how the large scale circulation modulate the small scale diabetic processes and weigh these feedback on the large scale. So I wrote a, a large grant outline to participate in this project, sort of like RICO, but um, involving climate again and, uh, and uh, cloud circulation. So if that comes about, we can, there may be some collaboration there. And then with uh, Jim and, and Rita, which is um, we've got this huge project called uh, GCRF African Swift um, you can see the Swift there but not the African part So, um, with Doug Parker John Marsham um, we're trying to improve forecasts or help the Africans improve their forecasts um, the weather forecasts I, l I like it because it's end-to-end, -end. Uh, the users are, are involved, but and there's an awful lot of uh, research involved in, in the UK as well, but there's collaboration with, uh, different, with Jim and Rita's project called, called Highway and, and maybe others. So, okay, that, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Oh. And I open it up for uh, discussion and questions. That's sure very interesting. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not sure that you showed it, but in your uh, Cornwall uh, observations, do you have an idea of how much was warm rain of that and how much of it was really involving the ice phase? Uh, not, not quantitatively. Um, there, we had some clouds that were only warm rain, and warm rain was involved in, in all the clouds at, at some point. The, there were relatively high reflectivity values, uh, 55 dBz in the warm rain, um, when the cloud was just warm rain. Um, but in deeper clouds, the warm rain kept on growing, <laughs> so it was difficult to uh, say whether it was just rain or not. Yeah, I kept, couldn't help but thinking about the difference between your your case and and Cope and the Balcastle storm. That one, it just sits there, rains for hours. Yeah. Hard. Yeah. And the other one, you have all these, you know, the maximum areas moving around. So you showed all the downdrafts and updrafts. And Balcastle, they're probably the probably the convergence just sat there. 
Yes. Never got tore apart. Not true. So what does the uh, what does the cloud physics tell us about that? I don't know what we the cloud physics. We didn't get any good downdrafts. So. We never had any cloud physics in the Boss Castle. That's one of the motivations. I know, but what do you think? <laughs> I think I think that a lot of it is dynamics. Actually, that that region. Well, I mean, it's controlled by so many things. It, it, uh, large scale synoptic uh, effects uh, as well that there was influence. But these are both gust fronts, right? Yeah, not gust sea fronts. Sea, breeze sea breezes. Fronts, yes, but then the the wind speed and direction has to be constant <laughs> in the at the other side as well. Uh, and and there was orography there, which I'm sure played a role. Yeah, but, but you're right. I know what you're getting at is that there were definitely there was there were definitely downdrafts produced by the precipitation here, and Pete Clark made the comment in that paper that that even though there was a lot of precipitation in Boss Castle, it didn't seem to produce a gust front that would distort the yeah, convergence the line. And I I don't quite understand that because there must have been downdrafts. <laughs> so I, I for some know. reason they weren't cold. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It is curious. So um, I'd like you to elaborate a little bit more on this thermal thing of yours. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's very simple. Uh, <laughs> um, Straightforward, actually. So I, I, I think there's a, for example, if you have multiple thermals, you you could have the first thermal producing grapple, and the second thermal producing the conditions that the grapple could interact to produce helmet mossup. Have you thought about that at all in terms it of It could the be the one thermal if if they, if it fell through the updraft, if the updraft was variable. But if you've got another thermal coming through, then the grapple's fallen down and the, and the new thermal comes through and you provide more liquid. That's Exactly. Yeah. Have you th I, I was thinking, have you thought about that? And also, well, this all depends quite a bit on the wind shear. Yes, uh, absolutely. Is, yes, absolutely. Is there a sweet That's spot there for very, the wind very, shear? Very, well, I... Uh, uh, I mean, no, I don't really know an absolute value. But if it's leaned over too much wind shear, till the precipitation will fall out. And that happened on the 15th of August in 1984 in uh, the Coral Project, where the clouds were. That was the only day. Usually, there's no wind, not much wind shear in the New Mexico clouds, but this day there was, and and we didn't see uh, the same development of precipitation. I mean, is there a a sweet spot for the wind shear? You want no wind shear? Or do you want just a little bit of wind shear? Or uh, obviously, you get a lot of it. It's not going to help very uh, much. That's a, well, that's a good question. I haven't really thought. I mean, no wind shear is, I think, is quite good <laughs> um, for these. These are pretty, not very deep clouds. Not, you know, not very long lasting. Roy asked, was that? Any other questions? I was also interested in the thermal part of your talk, and I've seen these thermals, and I always wondered what controls their frequency and uh, when they occur, when they don't occur. You know, sometimes you have the interaction, sometimes you don't. I think it's related to Jeff's question as well. Yeah, 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 and pressure perturbation, um, what's going on below. I mean, in, the, in this situation, it's ideal for just generating them, the, this constant support. Airflow, but uh, so, so we—I I mean, we did the Improve Two project, and we identified certain ridges that would just con consistently generate yeah. thermals. Yeah, and they—they they would have a lifetime, and they would die out. And so yeah. then it depended on the wind speed, the wind shear, and you know the interaction with the topography. But if you have, uh, you know, I think that's fascinating how that whole interaction yeah. that you I, point out here. I. Well, I agree. It, there's, it's it's complicated, isn't it? Because yeah, it depends on wind shear. It depends on on the heating. It it depends. I mean, if you're on a mountain like New in New Mexico, uh, it just bubbles away there like that. But in other places, that uh, they move off. The one I looked at, the wind shear would would generate a, a convection, but the next one was so long in between that they wouldn't yeah. interact. So yeah. if you have one convec you know, one thermal and nothing happens, then it just dies out and then Yes, absolutely. So I think this so it depends on that too. When yes. it interacts and when it doesn't interact it really yes. plays a big role in the yes. precip formation. Yes. And the variability in the updraft too, I think. I just so kinda of thought about that really. Um and if you have that variability, some of the grapple could fall down, and that's then that thermal. And I mean, the thermal can is 
we tend to think, well, it just takes this, this amount of time to get there, but, but there's all the rest of it too, isn't there? The depth of the thermal. Any other questions? Okay, if not, then let's uh, thank Elm one last right. time. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you.